hearing is called to order. Uh, I want to welcome all the witnesses. Thank you for your uh, thoughtful testimony. I see a lot of work went into it, and, and certainly I, I uh, appreciated reading uh, all the information that was contained therein. Um, this is our second hearing having to do with the security of, of the United States borders. Um, as we found out in our last hearing, it was uh, pretty prominent in, in testimony that uh, the border is not secure. Uh, I would agree with that assessment. I think we also are coming to realize how incredibly complex this, this problem is. Now, I come from a manufacturing background, and I've solved a lot of problems. And there, there's actually a process you go through to solve a problem. It starts with really understanding, uh, ascertaining, uh, admitting to reality. A lot, a lot of times, reality is not you know, particularly fun to acknowledge or have to face. But uh, if you're going to solve a problem, you have to understand the reality situation, you have to accept it. Uh, the next step in the problem solving process is establish achievable goals. Uh, set yourself up for success, not failure. Once you do those two uh, important first steps, uh, then you can start crafting strategies. Uh, I think in the past, we've bypassed those first two steps. And as a result, uh, I read, and I, I want to read it again, I've, I've read this list of bills that we passed in Congress uh, to try and address this problem and started out in 1986 with the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Back then, uh, we recognized we had a problem and the unauthorized population in America was uh, about 3.9 million. Uh, we progressed to the 1990 Immigration Act, um, about 3.5 million people here illegally. In 1996, we passed the Illegal Immigrant Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act. Uh, by that point in time, there were 6.3 million people in the country illegally. Uh, 2001, as part of the Patriot Act, uh, we uh, instituted an entry or passed a law to uh, require an entry exit system. Uh, by that time, there were 9.6 million people in the country illegally. 2002, Enhanced Border Security and Visa Entry Reform Act. Uh, now we're up to about 10.3 million people in the country illegally. 2004, the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act. Now we're up to about 10.9 million people. Uh, 2006, the Secure Fence Act. 11.7. I, I just want to stop there for two seconds. I, I did, as, as I've thrown myself in this, this problem, really trying to recognize the reality, I, I asked my staff members uh, to print me out the Secure Fence Act, because I, I, I wanted to study that piece of legislation. It's, it's hard to read. You, you don't read a bill. You have to study it. And so I, I wanted to spend a weekend really going over the Secure Fence Act so I could really understand the complexity of it and, and uh, figure out what we can do to do a better job of that. Uh, well, I didn't need the weekend. I only needed five minutes because the Secure Fence Act was two pages long. Um, that obviously didn't work. And then 2007, we had the, the 9-11 Commission's Recommendations Act, and again, our illegal population now is about 12 million. So, yeah, I just point out the fact that we have passed bill after bill after bill, and we haven't solved the problem. You know, I guess definition, we've heard this before, definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So. Uh, I want to address this problem the right way, uh, recognizing reality. This hearing is really about uh, trying to lay out the reality and, and a very important component, maybe the most important component of this problem, transnational criminal organizations, drug trafficking, human trafficking, uh, terrible problems. And I'll, I'll, I'll complete my, I, I do have a written statement that I'll ask to be included in the record without, without uh, objection. Um, I just want to quote from a report on Op Operation Strong Safety. This was a report given to the 84th Texas Legislator in the Office of the Governor on January 28, 2015, that uh, summarizes the problem. Uh, first of all, in, in this report, it says, there is ample and compelling evidence that te Texas-Mexican border is not secure. And then they go on, the ascension of the Mexican cartels of the states and as the states and nation's most significant organized crime threat. And Mexico's most significant domestic security threat is directly attributable to a porous U.S.-Mexican border and an unending demand in the U.S. for illegal drugs, forced labor, and commercial sex. Um, I think that kind of encapsulates, based on the testimony I was, I was uh, reading, uh, what we're going to be talking about today. And again, it's about laying out the reality problem, which is going to be the first step in solving it. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our very capable ranking member for some opening comments. Koskin, uh, I'll start my questioning with uh, General McCaffrey. Uh, I, I just want to understand a little bit more, uh, have you clarify 
your, your opening comment where you said conditions have improved. Now, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the fact that we, we've certainly closed down some of these corridors and we've, we've built fences and, and certainly places uh, in California and some of these areas are certainly far more secure, but it's kind of like damming up a, a flood. Water just kind of flows around. Uh, exactly. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you don't have a comprehensive uh, defense that acts in cooperation with foreign countries, I might add, it's hard to imagine how you ever get there. But it's still a great contribution. I mean, San Diego makes a perfect example. San Diego, Tijuana, uh, before the, the barrier fencing went up, was a nightmare. The year before that fence went up, and, and these numbers are approximately right, there were 70-some-odd murders, many of them in broad daylight, uh, I, I asserted at the time 100 percent of the uh, women trying to cross that frontier were sexually assaulted. Uh, you couldn't use the beaches on either side of the, uh, the frontier. Thousands of people would run down the interstate in broad daylight getting hit by cars. That sort of chaos has ended. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's because of resources, technology, competence, strategy uh, of CBP. Having said that, uh, you know, it seems shameful to me that I would be able to tell you that there are places in Arizona and Texas, as well as New Mexico for that matter, where our border is not under our control, where there's a four-bar uh, strand barbed wire fence, where there's no law enforcement presence on the frontier. So we just got to get a uh, coherent, long-term approach to border frontier. And by the way, it's not impossible to do this. I frequently run into the response that says, now, nah, come on, uh, it's an illusion that you could actually stop traffic across a 2,000-mile border. You can't stop it, but you can create conditions of law and order throughout the frontier region if we give people the tools and the right supervision. Again, so, so we've improved conditions in some areas, some sectors, some cities, but we certainly haven't solved the problem. I did want to go to, because you, you obviously were in charge of a, uh, you know, our drug problem here, uh, in your testimony, you, you, th you state that somewhere between 5 and 10 percent is the level of, of drug interdiction, which means 90 to 95 percent of, of illegal drug trafficking is succeeding. It's, 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 it's getting through. Uh, we spent, I've, I've seen some briefings, about $25 billion per year on our war on drugs. Uh, can, can you just speak to the extent of that problem and, and you know, wh where we are on that? I mean, it seems like we are a long way from, from solving that, from, from actually winning the war on drugs? Well, you know, I, Senator, I've always been a little bit reluctant to use the term war on drugs. I tell people, if you want a war on drugs, sit down to your own kitchen table and talk to your own children. Sure. That, that's really where it starts. But, but to put it in context, uh, when you look at America, 315 million of us, overwhelmingly, we don't use illegal drugs. And the rate dropped dramatically from 79, the peak rate of around 13% past month drug use, uh, it got down 6 or 7 percent. We were doing pretty darn good. Uh, adolescent drug use rates dropped dramatically year after year. Thirteen years in a row, they came down. Five years in a row, they've gone up. And the problem isn't Mexican cartels driving it up. It's medical marijuana. It's a conversation that's lacking in the United States about the chronic the absolute disaster of chronic addiction. I spent a lot of my time working in that field still. So I would argue that, um, that we, we, in accordance with international law, in accordance with our neighbors, we need to cooperate in drug interdiction. And by the way, without it, it would be a damn disaster. Uh, we weren't in Colombia. We were in Peru and Ecuador, less so, almost non-existent now. You got to go out there and help people on the ground with their conditions. Senator Carper talked about El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. It's just complete nightmares now of law enforcement. It's not just drugs, by the way. You know, the Canadians got drugs up north, but they're not slaughtering each other with AK 47s. These are institutional uh, lacking capacity in, the, in Central America and broken cultures. Yeah, let, let me understand. So you're saying that we, have, we were making progress in terms of reducing, reducing the demand in America for drugs. Do you believe the number of drugs coming to this country has been reduced over, over the last 20 years? Or, I mean, what, what, is, what would be the total stats on that? Is it going well, up you know, or if, down? Uh, 
when we do well at reducing transit of heroin across the frontier, uh, druggies turn to synthetic opioids. So for several years in a row, OxyContin, Percocet, diverted legal narcotics was the problem. Um, it, fortunately, Congress, state of Florida and other places cracked down on that. Uh, so I tell people it's not the kind of drug we're seeing, it's drugged behavior which brings criminality, ill health, destruction of families. Um, part of it ought to be stopping the flow of drugs across the frontier, of going to source production of drugs and supporting those governments to deal with it. But that's not the way to defeat the problem of drug addiction, I wouldn't think. My, my, my time is running short, so I, I will get to the other witnesses in my second round of questioning. But I, well, I, I have Jim McCaffrey. Uh, I am highly concerned about the nexus between drug cartels and international terrorism and, and a growing connection with, with money laundering. I've, I've, I've been briefed on a number of things just in terms of the sale of used cars and, and the use of that in terms of uh, money laundering. Uh, can, can you just speak to what you've seen in terms of the progression of that nexus between potential Islamic terror, international terrorists, and, and the drug cartels? Well, you know, thank God for the NSA, the CIA, and U.S. Special Operations Command, without which we'd have a disaster would have occurred over the last 10, 12 years in this country. They're doing an incredible job in the international community. The backup in the United States is increasingly sophisticated. The FBI and, uh, and other federal law enforcement, CBP in particular, are extremely good and have the deterrence factor of federal law enforcement is enormous. People say, the terrorists say, you know, if we're going to attack some place, let's go to Paris, uh, Madrid, uh, Indonesia, as opposed to trying to get to New York City. So we've done tremendous work in that area also. Having said that, if we've got half a million people that walk across the frontier from Mexico every year, which is the case, a quarter of them actually come out of Central America, we're picking up Pakistani nationals, Iraqis, uh, jihadists out of uh, uh, Crimea, all sorts of goofy people are showing up on that frontier. So far, not an organized terrorist operation. It will happen. We've got several thousand foreign fighters with ISIS right now, primarily Europeans, a handful from America. We're going to see them come home. And the obvious way to get into the country is across the frontier, not through trying to uh, talk talk down a CBP officer in, at Dulles Airport. Thank you, General. Uh, Senator Carper. Senator Booker, before you leave, I, I, because you weren't here with the opening, and I just need to assure you there was no racial intent, uh, absolutely no re purpose behind this to bring race into this at all. This hearing is about laying out the reality. I'm happy to hold a hearing on problems with the northern border. And right now we're talking about transnational crime. We had a picture given to us by a sheriff in, from Mission, Texas, that's just showing the impunity with which the drug cartels operate on the other side of the border. This was, this was a turn back situation, and that's the only purpose of that, uh, was to tr lay out that reality. I'm happy, if, you, if you've got a good picture that illustrates a particular reality on the northern border, happy to put it out here, but there was absolutely no racial intent of, of that particular picture. This was just showing the impunity of, of the drug cartels and how they operate on the southern border, okay? Senator, or, uh, General McCaffrey, uh, real quick, I know in our office you, you, you said you didn't really particularly like talking about the total dollar value of, of the drug uh, problem in the world. Uh, I know the UN reports it's about a $320 billion uh, per year uh, business. Uh, quite honestly, I, thought, I, I was actually surprised it's that low. I thought, thought it'd be a bigger problem. Do we have any sense, I'll ask any of the uh, witnesses here, do we have any sense in terms of the dollar value of the human trafficking component, the, the sex, sex trafficking, and then the, the amount of money people, the, the drug cartels also make off of the illegal immigration, which I, I to a certain extent, I separate human trafficking, sex trafficking from the illegal immigration trafficking as well. A anybody have any sense in terms of the, just the dollar value, the, the enormity of that? Now, if, let me add a quick interjection. I tried to get law enforcement to stop briefing me on the dollar value of drug seeds. They have no value. It's all situational. If you're a dentist in uh, Miami, you'll spend 5000 bucks a weekend on cocaine. If you're a poor boy in Rio, you can get a bazooka uh, cocaine-paste cigarette for $2. 
uh, heroin has, uh, the supply of illegal drugs always grossly exceeds the demand. That's the key. And then when you get into synthetic manufactured drugs, it's, of course, an unending you're, just, you're saying the, so, supply. You're saying the supply exceeds the demand? Always, across the board. I mean, some yeah, because it's so lucrative. I mean, there's so much money to be made in it. It's so easy to make them. There's no industrial product. We're not talking Mercedes cars or, or growing fine wine. So the supply out there is unconstrained. And so it depends on who you are, how much you'll pay for the drugs. Um, I think it's better to measure shattered lives. It's better to go to monitoring the future and talk about kids dropping out of school. Better to go to the hospital emergency rooms, all of which we do, and see who's on what drug when they come in. Yeah. No, I understand. Uh -huh. As an accountant, though, you know, I re so much of this, is, let's face it, it's, it's driven by the profit motive, and there's enormous amounts of money to be made, and I'm just trying to get my head around that. Mr. Torres, this is almost totally aside, but you made a comment. Yeah, you know, I'm new to the public policy, just came to the Senate in 2011, but you said you, you were part of the Bin Laden unit. Is, is that what the name of the unit actually was back in 1997? Right, it was the U Osama with a U, Osama Bin Laden unit. Uh, was created in early 1998, and um, I left that unit in 2000 to run the Denver office, but it continued for years after. Okay, again, that just caught me by surprise. I was, I was not aware of that, um, that, we, that we knew so much about Osama bin Laden that we actually had a unit set up within the FBI. Uh, Ms. Kemshaw, uh, you, you talked about the scouting networks. Uh, what, what laws are in place, or are there no laws in place that we can arrest those individuals that we basically know? I mean, is there any, any control that we can have? Because we were down the border, and, and literally, we, we were standing right next to a scout. I know we were. He, had, he, was on, he was on his phone. He was communicating our position to the, his, his, his uh, members of his gang on the other side. W what laws are in place? You know, it, it is a scary feeling, isn't it, when you know someone's watching you and calling out your positions as a law enforcement official to the bad guys that you're trying to apprehend. You know, it's been a challenge for us to prosecute the scouts um, because it, it was just nothing specific for them. And, and I think it's important that there are consequences to their bad actions because if they're not facing significant jail time, then they're just going to continue to do it and be replaced because it's an opportunity to get into the United States, a slap on the wrist, they go back, and then family members can come back and replace them. So it's important that laws are created, that these scouts will face significant... So currently we don't have laws. They're, they're very difficult to prosecute. And, and of course, if we did have laws, they'd be using minors, which is another problem, correct? That is a significant problem, because we're seeing that across... Uh, as the children are being used to bring drugs in across the ports, because in the federal systems, it, it's very difficult to prosecute a minor. So now we have to have that prosecution handled by a county attorney in a border town that has very limited resources. And, and, but the, the law enforcement community feels like you cannot let these crimes go unpunished or they're going to continue. They're so that was a shock to me when I was down the border and I was talking to local law enforcement and there were a couple, couple of things that revealed to me that, that was shocking. First of all, I've always viewed this jurisdictional battles that went between the feds and local was to actually be able to take control of the case, prosecute it. That's not, that's, those aren't the jurisdictional battles. They're actually fighting over not taking the case because it's so costly. The, the other surprise was that uh, I was told by local law enforcement that unless there's 500 pounds of marijuana involved, they don't even bother. Is, is that, can you confirm that, that the, the, at, those told at, me is basically true? At one point in time, there was a minimum mandatory for federal prosecution. I don't know that that's in place today, but I think that you see that we've had a plus up of Border Patrol and when you plus up one agency, which is important, because in, in the Border Patrol agents have an incredibly difficult job in Arizona and across the border, but we needed to plus up the rest of the infrastructure, the marshal service, the judges, the jail systems, you know, the federal system, the infrastructure for the entire criminal justice federal system was at a breaking point when we had so many illegal immigrants being arrested. The drugs were coming across the border. We were having the miners bringing them across. The, the scouts in the mountains, it, it was just a difficult way to get these people prosecuted. Well, let's talk about what, what might work. Uh, you know, I think, Jim McCaffrey, you were talking about fencing will in the right spot if it's constructed properly. Uh, I know uh, Operation Strong Safety, when I read that report, it uh, sounds pretty strong that having more 
more boots on the ground, you know, more, more enforcement officers at the border. Sounds like that actually works. I don't know how many more we would need. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the budget right now. The Border Patrol, those 60,000 agents cost about $12 billion per year. Uh, obviously, need a cost-benefit uh, analysis on that. But uh, Chief Deputy Martinez, can you talk a little bit about uh, boots on the ground, how effective uh, Operation Strong Safety has been? It's, it's been very productive, and it has helped us tremendously on our end, being 70 miles north of that, of that Rio, uh, Rio Grande River. It, it has helped us where we see minimal drop-offs. We see groups of 20 versus groups of 70 being crossed through, through, through the, uh, the brush. Uh, and a lot of these issues has to do with boots on the ground. But w with that, though, you also need your, 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 your technology to work hand in hand so, so we can uh, make every effort to interdict every single person that comes across. Because you, that one you person can, that's... You, you that's, can detect, but if you don't apprehend, it doesn't do, do you much good. But then if we apprehend and we just process and... That, 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 that is correct. And just to reinforce what she just mentioned is the fact that if you don't have the, the prosecution at the level that should be at, and I'm, I'm referring to the USA, uh, uh, if they're not capable of handling this type of volume of cases, these cases are going to walk because they've done it before in Brooks County. We, we literally have caught the scout. We literally have caught the smuggler with the people. Now, once they interview the people being transported, if, if they can tie in that particular scout to that smuggling organization, well, then that's a plus. But if they don't, that, gen that person is going to walk. And, and pretty much he's literally going to walk because he probably don't have any type of identification on him, no driver's license or anything like that. So, so what, what percent of those scouts walk? What, what percent of, of people you want to prosecute, we just don't? A very good percentage of them walk. Okay. Senator Carper. Thanks, Senator Carper. Well, obviously, coming from a manufacturing background, I've solved a lot of problems, and root cause analysis is, is essential, but you have to first understand the reality. That's what we try to do here. Uh, Senator Carper uh, kind of asked our wrap up question. I've, I've learned that from him, giving all the witnesses an opportunity to make a, a final point. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, go, I'll go and do the same thing, but uh, in Ms. Kemshaw's uh, when you think about your closing comment, you talked about intelligence. I'd kind of like to hear something about that. But in general, this, this hearing really was about transnational crime, you know, that, that reality, that element of this. And again, my concern is the, the nexus between transnational crime, uh, the growing threat of Islamic terror, international terrorists, homegrown extreme violence. Uh, as, as Ms. Kemshaw was talking about, there's, there's two parts to this. We, we've got illegal immigrants coming here working. And we've got people coming here to do this country harm, whether it's drug cartels, human sex trafficking, I mean, evil people. And that we must stop. But again, just go down the list, your, your final thoughts, uh, potentially address my final points there, uh, General McCaffrey. Well, I thank you for bringing attention to this issue. You know, one of the, uh, the other cautions I, when I give talks to Rotary Club or Chamber of Commerce is people talk, well, what happens when violence comes across the frontier? It's already here. There's a thousand communities right now, 200 major metropolitan areas where the principal threat to the American people and organized crime comes out of Mexican cartels. Uh, so we, we shouldn't talk about, you know, when it happens. It's already uh, taking place. Ms. Torres. Transnational crime has to cross one of our borders, whether it's a land border, a seaport, airport, or even our, our cyber border. And we see the impacts of that in our communities every single day. While it may be occurring on the southwest border or on the Canadian border or even at Dulles Airport, ultimately it, it ends up in, in our backyards with regards to drugs, national security, human and sex trafficking. We saw too much of that. And uh, so thank you for focusing on this today. Thank you, Ms. Kemshaw. Senator, I, I think that we must understand when it comes to drug trafficking organizations that these are criminal organizations and they bring their drugs to the United States because we have an appetite for illegal drugs. And I think to address that problem, we must continue those education efforts. We must continue to teach our children 
that the dangers of drug abuse, even experimenting once with dangers of, of illicit drugs. And we also must use that intelligence that we develop from our investigations and our interdictions to, to make Arizona one of the primary gateways, an undesirable route for the cartels. If we can push them out of their comfort zone, then we can make them more vulnerable. And if, they, if it's more difficult for them to bring their drugs into the United States and there's a less of an appetite for, for their product in the United States, then we are going to break the backs of these drug cartels. But the only way that we can do that is to appropriately target our limited resources on the most significant drug trafficking organizations impacting our communities. So I think it's a multiple approach, education and using intelligence to drive our enforcement strategies, combining federal, state, and local and tribal resources against those significant targets. Thank you. Chief Deputy Martinez. Yes, sir. Until the United States is serious about securing the border, the transnational criminal organizations will continue to operate on the border and within small communities and throughout major cities of the nation. We have to have a balance here because of our humanitarian issue that we have in Brooks County with all those bodies dying. We need to make sure that our national security issues are addressed to where we can identify the bad guy versus those that come in to assist the economy. And also, the crime is here and it will continue to grow. Mr. Thank Baskin, over 30,000 Americans died last year from drug overdoses. I think that's a threat to our communities every day. As we deal with that, I think what we can do as law enforcement, we have to encourage intelligence and information sharing to, to accomplish our mission and make it stronger. Well, again, thank you all. I know you spent a lot of time on your testimony. It's extremely helpful. It helps us create that record, lay out that reality. Uh, so, again, thank you for your th thoughtful testimony, your thoughtful answers to our questions. Uh, this hearing record will remain open for 15 days until April 8th, 5 p.m., for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.